My name is Krzysztof Wodiczko, and I'm uh, coordinating a program in the art and the public domain here at the Graduate School of Design. Uh, this evening, uh, we, uh, we are privileged to have here uh, Meryl uh, Leidenman Eucalis, who is an artist uh, very well known, but I need to uh, say a few things. Uh, it's quite possible that uh, not many of you are aware of uh, some uh, details and aspects of her work. Uh, it's because this school uh, is not yet as well versed on uh, contemporary art context, but we are working on this, and uh, uh, Meryl uh, Euclid will definitely help us to uh, move forward, uh, make a big leap. Uh, she is an artist uh, in New York City who has been thinking about urbanism, ecology, and the politics of city labor for much longer than many of us here at GSD. For this reason, of course, we're very grateful that Meryl could come here tonight, be with us. <coughs> but she must be acknowledged and praised for her original focus on and pioneering work that addresses the relationship and complex convergence of aesthetics, ecology, feminism, and labor. In fact, dignity of labor as a part of what we recently have called here at GSD the ethics of the urban. Eucalyptus has been working since 1960s on art uh, that addresses environmental issues, the city as a living entity, service, labor, and more in long-term performances, research works, and other public practices. Her work is currently being shown in many places. Um, the show called Unnatural Limits at the Austrian Cultural Forum in New York. Uh, also, Materializing Six Years, Lucy Lippard and the Emergence of Conceptual Art, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Assistance Exhibition of David Kordansky Gallery at Los Angeles. She has an uh, upcoming solo show at Graz Kunstverein starting in March. I have no idea how she actually manages all of those things. <laughs> uh, why actually continuing to work on her long-term project. Um, uh, her ongoing permanent work since uh, 1989 include the Fresh Kills Park in New York City, part of the Department of Sanitation, and the Turnaround and uh, Surround uh, in Do uh, Donahue Park here in Cambridge. Her works is included in recent publications, such as Tom Finkelperl, what we made, the art of social cooperation. Uh, Connie uh, Butters, uh, Lucy Lippard's numbers show, the title of the book, uh, and the social works by uh, Shannon Jackson. Those are, uh, I'm sure I missed some of those books, but uh, it's very important that those books are being made because <coughs> this is the only way uh, the younger generations of artists can learn that uh, how to actually move forward with uh, this kind of art. And I will speak about this a little more. So her work, uh, of course, is also subject of the books uh, specifically focusing on, uh, on, on ballet works, ballet book works, um, from uh, Sternberg Press in Berlin. Her body of work is exemplary as re also as a reactualization of the avant-garde tradition. I'm not afraid here to use this word, avant-garde. No. We should not be ashamed of this word, although it was pretty well uh, kind of uh, <coughs> put down by those who invented the concept of neo-avant-garde and so forth, some of whom are teaching here at Harvard University in Art History Department. But I'm here referring to the avant-garde tradition that was represented by Soviet artists of productivism, constructivism, and even prolet cult. The artists uh, who were working, uh, as uh, Walter Benjamin uh, uh, called it, as uh, authors, as producers, as operational artists, that's his term. And <coughs> the work is very relevant for us today. Uh, as much as it was then, 
because despite of uh, our own apparent weakness and marginal position, we must work with, not for, or on, or on behalf people in developing their own capacity to combine design, politics, and affective, affirmative aesthetics, to work with people. That's the tradition that's coming from, uh, from uh, uh, the Soviet uh, context, which is very different than today. But methodology actually is strangely sim strikingly similar. I will come back to this a little later. And we must work in this way with others, such as social workers, urban geographers, community organizers, psychotherapists, doctors, scientists, uh, scientists, technology researchers, and, and many, many others, because the world is too complex to work alone. So transformative tradition of the avant-garde is not just the contestational one. In fact, contestation or criticism uh, may be very well embedded or us into one transformative uh, work, work towards change. Forty-five uh, years ago, Euclid wrote in the Manifesto for Maintenance Art, uh, in, she in, in which she declared that survival work, maintenance, and art, including her domestic work and her art, were one, one thing. The, the sour ball of every revolution is that after the revolution, the question is who is going to pick up the garbage on Monday morning, she'd say. Of that period during which she became a mother and began to understand very well the informal, invisible, undervalued labor of parenting, she has said, it is as, as if I looked up suddenly after all my formal education autonomy and I saw people doing support work to keep something else going and not necessarily only uh, ab about themselves. They were the workers, the workers. The workers, not uh, unlike uh, those who are here, the 61 often nameless workers who themselves support and maintain the enormous operation of the GSD. Who are more or less alienated from us, but in fact it is us who are alienated from them. So with her manifesto as the backdrop, she created 17 different performances works, including uh, I Make Maintenance Art One Hour Every Day. In 1976, Euclid accepted the unpaid position as artist in residence with New York City Department of Sanitation. There, she focused her energies on series of long-term projects, such as touch sanitation performance, 1978-1980, flow cities, the fresh kills landfill, and sanitation garage. We are, because we are in academic context, it's time to bring some historical uh, quotations. Well, I choose, <laughs> not surprisingly, a quotation from uh, economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844 by Karl Marx. He said, the alienation of the worker in his product means not only that his labor becomes an object, an external existence, but that it exists outside of him, independently, as something alien to him, and that it becomes a power on its own, the one that confronts him. It means that the life which he has conferred on the object confronts him and as something hostile and alien. Uh, so the question is, how can artists contribute, inspire, assist in the worker's de-alienation from his or her or their labor? How can the artist uh, do so against the, uh, uh, for the de-alienation of non-workers from workers' labor and de-alienation of ourselves from our own labor and from ourselves as laborers? So 
one um, of the things that uh, Euclid recalls in uh, various interviews is, is the moment when one of the workers said, look, you are not a normal artist, speaking of Euclid. You are a real artist. This show has to be real with trucks and barges. So why can't they see what it is like here? I would like to show, end my introduction with this slide. This slide shows, um, now of course this is, uh, I'm showing this slide only because it is part of, um, it is the part which is, um, which is in fact here uh, uh, brought to us back. And it's the past that follows the present, the present uh, and the future, which is part of, of a contribution of, uh, of Euclid. And this is uh, the, the past that belongs to the avant-garde tradition to which I referred before. This is the moment of that, of that tradition. This is Arseny Avramov, the best known uh, cr uh, cr for creation of, of the famous uh, uh, spectacle called the Symphony of the Factory Sirens. Uh, uh, you, he used the services of a huge uh, cast of choirs joined by spectators, the fog horns of the entire Soviet Caspian, Caspian flotilla, two batteries of artillery guns, a number of, of full infantry regiments, including a machine gun division, hydroplanes, and all the factory sirens in Baku. Baku being the capital of Azerbaijan. So this is, of course, uh, uh, not to uh, uh, force uh, Euclid's work back into the past. It's actually to show that, uh, that there is a future for this tradition. So I will let uh, 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 Euclid to show uh, the future of this tradition right now. Hi. I want to talk to you about freedom, about struggling to become free, and about necessity, which always sneaks up behind. I became an artist to be free, to have the levels of freedoms that I received from my Western culture artist heroes, freedom to act within the artwork, with the body, from my uncle Jackson Pollock, freedom to name, from my grandfather Marcel Duchamp, and freedom to pass from one dimension to another, from my uncle Mark Rothko. You might notice the genders. I struggled for years to win this freedom as artist. Then in 1968, out of free choice, desire, and great blessing, Jack and I had a baby. I became a mother. I became a maintenance worker. I had never done maintenance before unless I absolutely had to. I was down the block if I had to do maintenance. And here I was keeping this child alive. That's what it meant to be a mother, a maintenance worker. And I discovered that Jackson, Marcel, and Mark didn't change diapers not in 1968. 
I had fought so hard to get their freedoms. I fell out of their picture. Yet I had become so powerful, giving life and keeping life alive, learning to pay attention, to pay attention to the hum of getting from one breath to another, and also learning the mind-bending boredom of repetitive task work. At times I felt as if my well-educated brain was going to blow out of the top of my head. Goodbye, it was saying to me as I changed yet another diaper. I wasn't made for this. There she was on the changing table, smiling and gurgling at me. I loved this baby madly. I was twirling and I was discovering every teeny element of the external world with her as she discovered it. The world itself became reborn. I needed it for her. I was in full crisis. I felt like two people in the same body, the free artist and the mother maintenance worker, twirling. I had never worked so hard in my life to keep everything going, to keep all the balls up in the air. Yet people who met me pushing my baby carriage said to me, do you do anything? Falling, twirling, click, an honest to God epiphany. If I am the boss of my freedom, then I name maintenance art. I can collide freedom into its opposite and name necessity art. I name survival art. Why? Because I am the artist and I say so. I, me, as artist must survive. It is art and art history that needs to change. It all came together in one sitting when in a quiet rage I wrote the manifesto for maintenance art in October 1969. I was privileged to open my eyes and see most of the people in the world are doing maintenance work, support work. My first job after this realization to re-see the world, to start all over again like my baby. Part one is ideas. Development and maintenance. Development is traditional, linear, avant-garde art. Make it new, move into the unknown, destroy what you have done before. Maintenance is survival, what we now call sustainability, repetition. Part two is a proposal for an exhibition that has three parts called care. First part is personal maintenance. I live in the museum with my husband and baby. I do all the maintenance work, dust, clean, cook, feed visitors. Recrete, this is 1969. Are you even born? Plus, I do the dishes. The museum might look empty of art, but it will be maintained in full public view. My working will be the work. The second part is social, the, the maintenance of society. Interviews of 50 kinds of jobs, a representation of all kinds of work in our society. Prior interviews exhibited on the walls and during the exhibition, long tables of interviewers and visitors. I ask the classic questions about maintenance. How do you feel about spending the time you spend on maintenance? What is the relationship between maintenance 
and your freedom? And what is the relationship between maintenance and life's dreams? The third part is earth maintenance. The museum is, can be, the fulcrum site, the active site of transformation. Every day, polluted elements, earth, air, and water are delivered into the museum. A garbage truck, a container of polluted air, polluted water. In the museum, these materials are serviced and purified by scientists and pseudoscientists and artists, then returned out to the city healthy and full of energy so that out of the museum's power to be the cultural site of transformation, life in the city thrives. Please note, this is not the art of the happy cleaner. My ambivalence is extreme, twirling. The thing about an epiphany is that it is not narrow. It blazes, it radiates outward. The manifesto is a world vision and a call for revolution for the workers of maintenance. These are the workers of survival. First, women as the ancient uninvited maintenance class who were told who they were and what they're supposed to do. But nevertheless, so put there, we learned a few things or two in the last few tens of thousands of years, behind the scenes, at the side, downstairs, the other. And here is the revolution. Together, women with non-gendered service workers look around. That's most of the people in the whole world. Together, if organized in coalition, we could reshape the world. This is a piece called Washing in um, 1974. I yell every hour on the hour, quote, the cleanliness of this area is now being maintained as art from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. It will be normalized at 5.01 p.m. I begin washing. Soho was still partially industrial and much dirtier in 1974. Very dirty. I am in trouble. It is so dirty, I am running out of rags. The sidewalk is eating them up, and I have hours of washing to do. The gift, a super from a building across the street, has been watching me and listening to me for some time. He sees that I am in trouble. He arrives. He doesn't ask, what is this? Why is this art? Instead, he walks right into the art, bringing me an armful of tough new rags. And he says, and this was the only word exchanged between us, he says, here. He accepts me as real and enables me to keep working. I think from that point, the deal of my art changed, opening myself to become interdependent with others with a complimentary braided offering. That's Pamela C. Lee's term for Gordon Mata Clark's use of negative space as something active, not only empty. A braided offer for others to participate in shaping the work, not simply to receive it. This idea became real at this moment. I am so moved that I try to incorporate the gift into my body, wrapping his rags around and around to become my own foot and leg, wanting to turn my body, not just my hands, into a cleaning force. I become mop foot. 
he has entered my soul. I stand there at the end, facing two guys who even avoid coming into the territory I have taken over. This is 1974. These guys look groovier than the super. They look artier. But from here on, I belong with the super. I am in a new world of maintenance with actually most of the people in the world trying to keep going. This, the, uh, this project is called Turnaround Surround for Danahy Park, a four-part permanent work on a former terrible garbage dump inside Cambridge's city limits. Commissioned by the Cambridge Arts Council in 1990, uh, four parts have been completed between 1990 and 2006. It is characterized by highly experimental use of recycled materials unusual for a permanent public artwork. The research for part five will begin this year. When I discovered Danahy when I was invited to come do a project here, I went, I saw this central mound and I headed up to the top. And uh, in the driving rain, the deputy city manager said, you seem to be hanging around the top of the hill. And I said, well, most people will go to the top of the hill uh, when you come to a landscape to just to see better. And here you could actually turn around and have this fabulous 360 degree view of Boston and all, all around the area. The highest point in Cambridge at 72 feet. I said to him, um, is this going to be accessible, the hill? He said, no, it costs too much money. We don't have to do that. This was in 1990. And I said, is this a public place? He said, yes, it is. I said, if it's only for able-bodied people who can climb up this hill, is this a public place? Anyhow, it began a long conversation that we had that ended up in Cambridge agreeing to make a handicap accessible path called the Glassfall Path that's a, 50, that's a, a half mile long um, to the top of the mound. And this is a courtesy test that the Department of Sanitation and the Department of Transportation in New York City um, enabled me to do because they had a functioning glass fault project at the time uh, behind an old marine transfer station in Brooklyn. They did it as a courtesy for Cambridge. And I spent a year trying to uh, figure out how to broadcast designs into asphalt. I thought, wow, streets. That's a lot of work for a lot of artists. And I made steel stencils and broadcast um, this material into the asphalt, and then the, they rolled it into the, into the hot asphalt. The officials from Cambridge um, said they want to come down and see it. This was in the summer. And I said, I called up, I said, I have a successful test. Everything is sticking. It's okay, we can do designs in the streets. So they said, let's wait a while till it gets cold because asphalt moves around a lot from heat to cold. So they said, we'll come in the winter. And they came in the winter and the, the asphalt indeed had moved around and the glass pieces of these designs just came out. Uh, so we decided to use a traditional way of just cooking pieces of glass into asphalt. I think if I had been able to keep experimenting, I could have worked it out, but they said, that's it, Eucalese, enough experimenting, time to do the path. I went to uh, every level of school in Cambridge and collected bottles for the path. I said to the children, if you bring me bottles, 
You can walk around on this path for the rest of your life, and actually, it's going to get more beautiful as you get older. You can't say that about everything. So the kids brought me bottles from each level of, of school. And I also got a week's um, diversion of the first uh, re beginning of recycling uh, in Cambridge. It had just begun then. This is an overview of the half mile long glassfall path. Um, with um, it, the, it changes uh, how it looks as the sun moves over the site. It includes uh, regular glass uh, from the kids and from the first beginning of recycling in Cambridge and 10 tons of stained glass scrap that was donated from Spectrum Glass in Woodenville, Washington that they shipped across the country to put in to the path. Another part is called Galaxy Dance Floor. This is sited at the top of the mound, made of recycled rubber bits used in high quality running track, like the running track at the base of the mound. Only I worked with um, California Paint Company to try to develop a transparent medium, um, not, not uh, cooking all the uh, recycling into epoxy that's covered with, with paint, so I could use many different colors. This is a one-to-one -one test of the 24-foot disc made in an old building that was loaned by MIT. We had to keep the temperature over 100 degrees so the uh, uh, binder would, would cure. And this is the uh, installation, the Galaxy Dance Floor. Um, I took a five by seven inch photograph that was of a, a real galaxy that was made by an astrophysicist at MIT and I blew it up to 24 feet. I had to rearrange the galaxy a little bit because it was more rectangular and I needed it to be uh, rounder. And I've had wonderful experiences with uh, hearing about people um, who are able to be there in wheelchairs. Um, there's one young man, a student at Tufts, who said, I come here every day because this is my office. Now, because the Cambridge Arts Council was so experimental and allowed me to um, mess around with this material that had been unproven, it actually didn't last and it will have to be replaced. It faded, it peeled, and it's been vandalized as well. So within the next year, I hope that we'll repl replace it. And then part four is called Throne Room for the Queen and King of the Hill, uh, made out of recycled and some new aluminum. Sitting in uh, grasses that cover the hill called uh, part is called Wavers and Smellers. I, I, my desire for hanging around the top of the hill, since the rest of Danahe Park is packed with very needed recreational ball fields, is to offer a place where the question is raised, whose place is this? Who owns this place? And hopefully that people in this incredibly diverse city of Cambridge, and one of the most diverse cities in all of the United States, that people from so many places can come here and say, I'm the king of the hill, I'm the queen of the hill, and this is my throne, I own, I own this place. I'm, I'm going to be working on the concluding part um, uh, this next, over this next year with the Cambridge Arts Council and uh, I hope to engage people who live all the way around the park, incredibly uh, economic and social dif differentiation, uh, different groups, and um, hope to engage them in a, a place that again says, what can this place, what does this place mean? I own this place. What does that mean? This is my place. 
This is Fresh Kills, um, New York City, Staten Island. I have been obsessed with Fresh Kills for over 30 years. In 1989, I was awarded a Percent for Art Commission for Fresh Kills through the Department of Sanitation and Cultural Affairs in New York City. My scope, which took over a year to write, um, has two parts, to contribute to the end use and master plan of Fresh Kills, this was in 1989-1990, and to design, at that point it was an operating landfill, and to design elements of Fresh Kills as permanent work. Fresh Kills is almost three times the size of New York's Central Park. It consists of four mounds, north, east, south, and west, it was the biggest municipal landfill in the world until it was closed to receiving garbage in March 2001. I am so drawn to Fresh Kills, not only because of itself, but its surrounding context gives you a 360 degree picture of the basis of our entire culture with Fresh Kills as a kind of navel. To the west, to your left, New Jersey's oil tanks, farms of fossil fuel, upon which our culture is still entirely dependent. To the east, the large Staten Island Mall. Buy, 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 throw out, throw out, throw out. Imagine you could almost see, which is why I like it so much, lobbing the material used across the street and watching the West Mound grow up. You can see the effects of consumerism growing in front of your face and crisscrossing the site, a wondrous nature reserve, the remains of the original site's wetlands with navigable creeks and wildlife. And on top of the West Mound, the large form to your left, the haunting buried material debris of the World Trade Center, 50 acres out of 2,200 acres. My reconnaissance of Fresh Kills has been ongoing since the late 1970s, when I proposed making what I called public urban earthworks at all New York City landfills. There were seven at that point. Earthworks that you own and can visit via public transportation without having to fly to Utah or Nevada, often hiring a private plane. That's the condition of having, being able to go see the classic American earthworks. Some of my guiding principles for Fresh Kills Park since 2000 are, Fresh Kills Park can be a symbol of our power to create transformation of the land. Fresh Kills Park, can be a free university of ecology and the environment. And Fresh Kills Park needs to connect, to reconnect to all those who made it in the first place, a renewed social sculpture. This is an early work from a show I curated for the Municipal Art Society in New York City in 1990. Called, the show was called Garbage Out Front, a new era of public design. That was my hope at that time. This is an 18 foot high detail of my 36 foot high installation called Landfill Cross Section, showing two scenarios, one with natural and one with geosynthetic materials. Everything is one to one scale except the garbage, which could go from 50 to over 100 feet. I just couldn't fit it in. I wanted to make the law visible, the environmental regulations for putting garbage in the earth. And here are a few images from my six channel video artwork called Penetration and Transparency Morphed that I made between 1999 and 2002. Here are the barges in 2001. This was shot in the summer of 2001 no more garbage of fresh kills. They were hand cleaned, which is a really yucky job. Um, 
waiting probably to be auctioned. That was, the, that was probably the plan at that point. This is a drainage uh, system, one of many throughout the, throughout the site. This is the biggest leachate treatment facility in the world. Um, as Professor Kirkwood of Harvard said, this is civic architecture and should be an accessible learning site. This is the water as it's in process of being cleaned. It takes 15 years for a drop of water once it percolates into the soil, this is before the cap, to get to the leachate treatment plant. And this is me walking on the gas fields of the West Mound that summer with my assistant. I sort of think of it as Thelma and Louise of Fresh Kills. And this image uh, was shot in August 2001. That's a month before 9-11. It was the classic image that everybody wanted to see when you go to the top of each of the four mounds. The New York City skyline, the Empire State Building, and the World Trade Center. Professor Kirkwood, who's one of the, what I call path, 21 pathfinders I have in this video work that I made, it was a subject in the video, stood on the top of the mound pointing to this view and then pointing to the site to Fresh Kills. This was August 2001. And he said, is this Fresh Kills an annex to that? Pointing to the World Trade Center, pondering the scale of a city that makes such big buildings. Or he continues, is that the World Trade Center an annex to this? Commenting on the scale of our consumption. Tragically, a month later, both came true. The debris from the World Trade Center rests to fresh kills and forms a tragic layer to the future park. But please remember, that the debris rests in only 50 acres out of 2,200 acres. Right now, for actually several years, I've been working on a permanent work called Landing. That is an overlook with two complementary earth forms that shows three layers, three levels of learning to land on this renewed Earth. Uh, it's in the works, and I'm not supposed to talk about it. <laughs> so I'm going to show you one of the proposals that I made that's in the draft master plan that the city um, published in 2006 um, called Proposal for One Million People to Participate in a Public Artwork for Fresh Kills, Public Offerings Made by All redeemed by all. This is a proposal for what I now called a transgenerational public artwork that engages the entire 2,200 acre site. Here are the old, bad old days. And here's the beginning of um, the park. This is the official sanitation map of New York City. It is so dense because all the streets in the city are on this map, every one, so that sanitation, if you're in New York, knows how to find you, to remove your waste and recyclables. They know where you are. Think about it. They can interact with over eight million people a day. Eight million. This artwork for only one million participants sort of mirrors and piggybacks on sanitation's phenomenal operations expertise. Who said the artist ben Walter Benjamin is an operational an operational 
artists. Well, this, this piece piggybacks on sanitation's operations that I love. How does a place switch its meaning and become something else? The words site and place become confusing here. If you drive by or fly over, there are those mounds. Certainly they are in Staten Island, but when you stand there, you are actually standing on 50 years of Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens, and a little bit of Staten Island. These other boroughs have colonized this expanse on Staten Island below the pretty thin surface. Are you on the land? Whose land? We made this place in New York City between 1951 and 2001. It is ours from all over New York City. I believe that this site cannot be transformed into something else, no matter how beautiful it becomes, unless many of us who made it actively and personally attempt to renew it. What mind-blowing karma lingers in this abject 150 million tons of material below the surface? How can we start to approach forgiveness for what we did to this land? How many participants will it take? I propose a million. A bit of scale to scale, we can change the meaning of material that through social collusion has become unnamed. How? Donor citizens are invited to create something of great personal value or to select something of great personal value. I call these public offerings. These material objects must fit into the size of the possessing hand. These offerings are voluntarily released from private ownership. Yes, but not rejected. Their value stays with them. This is the opposite of what we call garbage. They are not abject refusals. Rather, they are released to be shared in community. How will a hundred, one million offerings happen? The offerings are gathered scaled up and transferred to the city at what I call cultural transfer stations all over the city. These public sites of meeting will become workshops prepared to receive offerings from each hand that offers. Where are these cultural transfer stations? An example, a city-owned museum like the Metropolitan and others in Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Queens. The sanitation commissioner has committed all sanitation facilities to become, quote, cultural transfer stations. They're very cool. After release, each offering is documented and registered. A new relationship is formed between donor, citizen, and city through the process of release and acceptance then transfer and exchange. This relationship is symbolized by a unique barcode given as a receipt to each donor. It becomes a repository of decodable information about the creator's identity and intention. As well, the barcode is the key for entry to a global web archive that will locate the coordinates of each offering at the site when the site becomes ready which may be decades from now. Here's an example of an offering embedded in its permanent housing in a recycled glass block. The barcode is engraved as part of the art. It reveals the intention of the, of the creator and his or her location. These blocks will become edges of miles of paths and retaining walls throughout the 2200 acre site. It will enable generations afterward to discover these objects and to explore the site on expeditions 
to find, say, great-grandfather's offering. I can find it at the park, and my uncle in Brazil can find it in the web archive. We both connect to great-grandfather and to each other. This new permanent layer of citywide land, now kissing the surface, enters the public domain as a huge flow force, revealing a new kind of reverence, reverence for the individual's intention materially expressed, respect for the material even though released from private ownership, and reverence for this land on which it sits. I have done uh, seven work ballets in New York, Pittsburgh, Rotterdam, um, France, and two in Japan. This is called Fullness Wachen Dance. This was done in 1985. Uh, ten garbage trucks and four little sweepers. That's I. That's for this symphony of sirens. The same. We're both waving our arms around. <laughs> and um, this is a project called Snow Workers Ballet for the Echigo Tsumari Triennial in Tokamachi City, Japan in 2003. This area of Japan in the, in the J Japanese Alps gets 12 feet of snow on average, sometimes more in the winter. That's, that's higher than most small buildings get drowned. The town gets drowned in the snow. These are the ballet dancers. When I first met them, we had tea upstairs in their garage, sitting on mats, and I said to them, I bet in the winter, everyone loves you. Is that right? They, no one spoke any English. I had a wonderful translator. Yes, right, right, they said. And then I said, I bet in the summer, everyone forgets all about you. Right? Yes, right, right. Well, next summer, I said, let's remind them. I refuse to design any movements in advance. They gave me three days with the workers, and I said, uh, we'll work it out. We'll work it out together. Oh, I drew um, diagrams uh, of the choreography, this four movement, four movements, and, uh, and my translator uh, wrote, I wrote in English, and she wrote in Japanese. Sort of looks like a like a um, Japanese scroll painting. This is a tragic love story of Romeo and Juliet that we did with trucks, 13 trucks. Here's the entry of the vehicles. You can see the audience on the bridge overhead in the background and along the side of the field. These are th these fabulous snow vehicles called rotaries. That's really the reason I decided to do this ballet, that even the snow vehicles are beautifully designed in Japan. It just blew, blew my mind. This is a segment from the tragic love story of Romeo and Juliet. We were working out in the field, trying things out, then come back to the garage, drawing. I was uh, feeling desperate that we hadn't really, that we ha hadn't really made something super special like, like we needed to. And I'm standing there with drawing with my back to the workers, and I'm saying from my one year of Asian art in undergraduate school, it's okay for men to play women's roles, and Japanese people love stories, like these cliches that, you know, linger in your head when you've forgotten every, just about everything else. I felt bad because I had these huge tire dozers, these three, and I had six 
fabulous rotaries and one little baby rotary. But then, and I had this humongous piece of farm equipment that they call a motor grader. So they, it works uh, also grading uh, highways. Big, scary. But I, there were also two medium size uh, tire dozers. And I felt very bad for the drivers of these two. They were just like, they looked like, you know, you wouldn't even turn your head if you saw these trucks driving down the street. They're like medium, mediocre, not much. And I felt that they were going to feel terrible that these other, you know, very powerful machines look so great and they just look medium. So I asked them, would you be Romeo and you be Juliet? Do you know the story of Romeo and Juliet? And everyone said yes. How would you like to do this story with our trucks? They said, yes, we will. So we, we worked it out. This is the chorus. We sort of rearranged Romeo and Juliet a little bit also. This is the chorus of tire dozers. Even though they are the biggest and strongest of all the trucks, they are narcissistic goof-offs. They're supposed to protect the young lovers. They are full of overweening pride. And here are the young lovers approaching each other tenderly. They are thrilled with each other, even though their families hate each other. They proclaim their love unafraid. They kiss. This is actually a very dangerous move, because if it's not done exquisitely, they will flip each other over. Ecstasy before doom. I hear a lady behind me sighing, oh, ooh, and the triennials photographer is very sophisticated man, his name is Anzai. He said, oh, this is so emotional, and it, it really was. The dozer chorus is so busy playing to the audience, swaying their blades this way and that, that they utterly do not notice the lurking evil motor grader who darts out from underneath the bridge and drives right between the couple and destroys them. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the motor grader. And this is the finale along the Shinano River with all 13 trucks. In 2011, I got a, le a letter from the triennial director from Kitagawa. He said, I am dreaming of working with you again in 2012. I received this letter one week before the earthquake, tsunami, and Fukushima. I figured I would like to come back, but I figured they wouldn't be able to pull off this triennial with such disasters. There was an earthquake in this region as well. And you know what they did? They did, they had it, and I, I, um, I went back, and uh, Romeo got another job, and Juliet retired with a bad back. We had a whole cast of new characters, a new boss, and they painted the trucks, um, uh, royal purple for Romeo and peach for Juliet, the blades, not, not the, just the blades. Um, and it came out, it came out great. I think, should I stop? A little bit, okay. Uh, this is Touch Sanitation. After one and a half years of research, talking to sanitation workers, I begin the performance ritual. I will make 10 circling sweeps around New York City. I refuse to experience through sampling. That's my husband's voice, sampling. He, he was trained as a city planner and a social, social planner. Sample. It'll kill you to go everywhere. It'll kill you to see all the workers. Sample. That's what you do when you want to find something out. 
I said nothing doing, only if I immerse myself in sanitation's wholeness can this art become real. I float through the entire system's everyday reality to face all the workers, to travel to every sanitation facility, garages, section offices, mechanical sweeper garages, snow operations, repair shops, borough command, commands, incinerators in those days, and seven landfills and headquarters, the whole system. I say I desire to make art, utterly public art, injected into the city's bloodstream, everywhere, not in special places. I face each of 8,500 sanitation workers, shake hands and say, thank you for keeping New York City alive. This is a truth that escaped our information drenched culture. Every day from headquarters, I got an agreement to send out a message where I am, a sort of mapping, tracking device, because that's how downtown communicates with uh, facilities all over New York City. This is a, called a telex. That's before fax and before email. I spend at least an eight hour, often a 16 hour shift, modeling my performance art time on their eight hour work shift, making increasingly fiery speeches at roll call. I'm not here to study you, to judge you, I am here to be with you. All the shifts, all the seasons, to walk out the whole city with you, to thank you. This is the South Bronx. This is Brooklyn. Then I walk out some of the thousands of curb miles with the Sandmen. At that time, it was an all-male workforce. We eat together sometimes on the curb because many restaurants won't serve salmon inside, often in miserable section stations. It is risky and possibly dangerous. As Smithson would call it, this expedition exploration is a taboo situation. It is also thrilling. Every day I face strangers. This is scary, but I am fueled by my own personal fury as a mother maintenance worker at how maintenance workers, both woman as the destined, though uninvited maintainer of the interior personal home and children, and sanitation workers, keepers of the exterior city as home, are not seen, not heard, not honored, dumped outside of the culture. This was done, I must say, at the height of the fiscal crisis in New York City in the mid-70s. At this point, 20% of the workforce had been laid off, and 65% of all the equipment, including the trucks, were broken and there was no money for maintenance. It was, a, it was a, a sort of catastrophic atmosphere. Here's another telex. They, uh, they went out every time I went out. It gets a little complicated. Do you know why everyone hates us? Many sanitation workers ask me. Why? Because they think we're their mother. They think we're their maid. I can't pick up after 100,000 people. It's just me. They said it as if it were obvious. If they were women, would it be OK to hate them? Would it? Who are they telling this to? It's 6 AM roll call again. That's it. It's high time to rupture this ancient, ridiculous bubble. I am like them, almost, and a bit not. This is a feminist artwork, and I'm aiming to build a coalition. I end up 
in the National Enquirer. I figured that would be the end. Sanitation had enough trouble without being in the, in the National Enquirer. I get a call from the commissioner's secretary, Gertrude. Have you seen the National Enquirer? I said, no, I, I don't read it. She said, get a copy and then call the commissioner. And I figured that was gonna be it. And he said, did you see the National Enquirer? I said, yes. He said, that guy's a schmageggy, get back to work. <laughs> I meet a sanitation worker. I see deep in his eyes what I've come to call the gates of acceptance. I see him looking at me and then I see his gates opening up. He has decided what the hell, I will trust her. I will tell her what it does to me inside when people think we are part of the garbage. He tells me amazing things. As maintainers, we are the same, those on the inside and those on the outside. I feel at home and he fully expects me to pass this along as an artwork, Ooh, I pass that up. We are exploding the old upstairs, downstairs cultural frame together. This is a, a stream that developed as I went along called Follow in Your Footsteps, as an imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I copy their moves out on the street to place myself in the same position of public exposure with the audience watching behind the curtain, lifting the Venetian blind, not talking to you directly. I also did it because it cracks them up. A dance develops. We're dancing. We're dancing in the street. I thought the performance itself would take three months and it ends up taking 11 months. It's hard on my own family. I would disappear at four o'clock in the morning to get to roll call at six. My six-year-old comes home from school and says to me, are there many garbage artists like you. <laughs> I mentioned this to him, he's now 40 years old. And I said, what did you say when that kid said that to you? As 40 year old, he said, I didn't say anything, I slugged him. <laughs> but as for me, I am just fine, treated very well with surprising moments of grace. Every day I send out a telex saying where I will be to touch sanitation so people all over New York know how far I've come. It's 3 a.m. I arrive at a dank little godforsaken God section office in the Bronx. I ask myself, what are you doing this for? I'm tired. Then the foreman says, I've been tracking you all year. I had said I'm going to do this, and they have been mapping me doing it all over the city. I don't run away. I keep coming back, just like they do. That's what binds us. That's our power. A human being always has the freedom to say no, but a human being also has the freedom to say yes. Thank you. have that much time left, but thank you for your interest in staying that long. Uh, I am uh, curious to actually know how are you working? I saw your office that <laughs> um, more recently, but I would like you to describe what is in your office, how your office operates in the sanitation department. 
what's in my office. Um, I, the sanitation, I'm not paid. I'm official and unsalaried. It's sort of a pact with the devil that I made many years ago. Um, the one side is I don't get paid. It makes it very hard, so I have, always have to try to be raising money for things to do my work. Um, but two, they don't tell me what to do. They do give me um, three office spaces, which are now filled with a lot of stuff <laughs> just filled because I'm trying to get ready to d organize an archives of all these decades. That's what you were looking at. Unorganized material waiting to become an archives. How many agencies are involved in that, in that project? In Fresh Kills? Um, I think there, someone calculated, I think there are about 45 government agencies that have a hand on turning Fresh Kills into Fresh Kills Park. So you have files from? I have a lot of files on Fresh Kills. Meetings, meetings are the bane of public art. A lot of meetings. <laughs> and making something happen in our culture, something big, something visionary, something different. Uh, it's difficult with so many people, you know, being able to say no. Mm. Often I think also people know how to say no because it's safe and they're afraid to say yes. I have one more question, which some in a, that belongs to the field that is to some degree we share, that is working with people. Uh, there must be some secret, or you have some secrets, how to uh, create conditions for those people to actually open up and feel free to develop their creativity as a part of the project. That, well, um, uh, a few things. Uh, I think do, uh, doing, I, w I always do a lot of research about a project before I begin it so that I, I try to know what I'm talking about if I enter into a situation with, with uh, people who often spend their whole work, work lives there. And I think listening, listening is about the most important quality for um, a person who wants to work in, in, with, to work with others, to be able to listen to them. Um, <coughs> also, you're, you're modeling that you want them to listen t to you also. I don't want to just listen, I want to talk. There, there's one thing, if I could uh, say a discovery I made, um, I fell into this discovery. The first time I did this um, uh, art parade, the grand finale of the New York City Art Parade, and after you know, excruciating negotiations with the city. Um, I, I got six, uh, I wanted to do what I called the ballet mécanique for six mechanical sweepers. This was in 1983. And the deal was, so it's always a deal. The deal was I get them for three days. Three days seems to be some sort of like limit of tolerance for working with an artist on these projects. I don't think I've ever had more time than that to do these work ballets. And uh, they gave me this, uh, uh, the training ground of sanitation workers out in Randall's Island in New York. I said, get me the, be the best drivers of mechanical sweepers, because I had driven around in them. I mean, it's just insane, like people double, you know, you have, you're supposed to clear, clean the street, and clean the curb, and people are supposed to be out of there and they're not out of there, they're double parked, they're triple parked. It's just, if they don't go crazy, it's just a miracle. So they, I, I show up in Randall's Island for these three days. We have a little shack on the edge of the field. It's like a models of street widths in New York. And six people come in, they didn't know each other, and I, did, I had never met any of them. And we sit down 
I say we have three days to do this. It's 32 blocks starting on 104th Street down to 72nd Street. They uh, it ran down Madison Avenue. They closed fully barricaded, full all-out parade. And um, this will be the grand finale. And part of it is a mirrored garbage truck, which I had also made. That would be Act 1. And then Act 2 is this ballet mécanique. Act 3 is this called Ceremonial Sweep, which I read was a Chinese ritual where um, the heads of department, it's a flip where they sweep the street. And so I, I got the whole sanitation uh, executive committee, the commissioner, the heads of the unions, to behind the mechanical supers to sweep the whole parade route. Uh, reporters who talk, who have power of the mouth and power of the pen, um, some foundation people, um, Ronald Feldman, the head of my gallery, and uh, Creative Time, they sponsored this. In between was this ballet mécanique. So the, the, the driver said to me, tell us what to do. <laughs> and that's because that's how they work. They're drivers, they go to the garage, and the super or the foreman gives them the job, the task at hand. This is what you do. Those are the conditions under which they spend their work lives. Go here, do this, do that. They're very highly skilled, but they receive what they do, and then they go do it. And I, as soon as they said that, I really this hadn't been planned. Here I am, an, you know, I'm an artist who comes out of, I started out as a painter, they got very big, became sculpture, wor used to working on my own. But I knew that telling someone what to do yanks the art right out from under their feet. That's not how art happens. By, I said, I'm not your boss, and I can't tell you what to do. I hope that you're so skilled on these machines. And I have a bunch of ideas also, because I've been watching them. And this, we have this 32 blocks down Mata clear. No tra you don't have double park cars. You have nothing. Clear, a clear street. What have you always wanted to do when the foreman and the super wasn't watching you? That's what I want. What have you thought about? behind that huge, powerful machine. Let's do that. Here's our excuse. It's art. And they sat there, and it went silent. And again, some people said, tell us what to do. I said, it can't be art if I tell you what to do. And you know more about these machines than I do. I have some ideas, but we have to, it has to rise up. We have to do it together. And in my head, it's going tick, 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 like I have three days. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is going to be a disaster. I'm going to have nothing. They're going to leave. What? I'm in a panic. But I knew as an artist, I said, just keep your mouth shut. Just keep your mouth shut. It has to rise up. And I sat there, and it was like a vacuum, like no oxygen. And then one guy says, I think he was just bored sitting there. He said, well, you know, I always thought we could do this or that. And then another guy said, no, nah, I don't think so. I think we could do this or that, and then I said, well, how about doing this or that? And they, usually they said, oh, no, that would really be stupid. <laughs> and we began to work. And then we went out onto the field. We tried this. I mean, they're fabulous. We tried that. They, they work ki where it's called kissing, the kissing brooms, also very dangerous because you can get tangled up in each other, but it's like, it's like to show you can get that close. And we cooked up this. That, that's what I'm talking about, that the 
that the control, the control doesn't belong to anybody. It has to, it has to, the peace itself didn't exist in me or in them. It, it came up together. That's what I mean. Was like, cause I, that's, as an artist, I knew that that, that's how it has to, I think I treated myself like that when I was alone in the studio, that it has to, it has to rise, rise up from nowhere, from the vacuum of terror. <laughs> That's how it happens. And it happens. So maybe it's time for some questions from the audience, if there's still well, it's a little bit of time here. Um, thank you. Can you all hear me? Okay. Thank you so much. You're just so beautiful to listen to. Uh, you tell such a wonderful story, and I think my question gets at that a little bit, as well as something that you just said about letting it rise up from silence. And you said, as an artist, you knew to do that. And I think, or I wonder if you could replace that with educator. And I know that you have somewhat of an education background, um, if I'm not mistaken. And so I wonder, my question is, what is the role of education in your work? What is the role of an educator for of a creator? I guess uh, of an artist and an uh, architect, landscape architect. Is that what you're saying? No, I would just it, I would ask you to interpret the question as you will. Um, and yeah, I guess it's it's not. I don't have any sort of answer in mind. I just wonder how you see the role of education in your work. And not that's not to say that you educate. I wonder, I imagine it's a two-way street, but just in general, given whatever background you may have. That when, when I went to art school, I was pretty allergic to being told what to do, um, which looking back, I think was sort of unfortunate because I could have learned a whole lot of skills. I had this like religious belief at the time that if I didn't need this for my work, I didn't need to know it. So that it was, it felt wrong for me to learn skills for skills, like sawing, hammering, stuff like that, which is kind of rigid, uh, too ideological. I thought, it, now I think it was ridiculous. Um, it came out of the notion of the avant-garde, that you do what you have to do, like that. Uh, in my experience, I've had some really horrifying teachers I had one teacher, we yelled at each other so much, he said to me, you're the only student in my whole life that I have night nightmares about. <laughs> but I've had wonderful teachers. So then I say to myself, what made them wonderful? What made them wonderful teachers? I respected them uh, for their own work as an artist. They were, they were really artists, devoted artists and they respected their students. They had great respect for their students that just came right, ac right across. And they were willing to allow a student to get into a lot of trouble. I think that's what I can say about, I don't know if I would say that if I were teaching um, a course, like a content course, like history or international relations, something. You know, I majored in international relations in college, and I started all over again, and it's, di it's different. The, the difficulty is like, uh, Christoph and I spoke about this. Um, I, I've spoken to people about work ballets, like ballets with trucks and barges, 100 tons of uh, a diamond, a cobalt blue stained, uh, crushed glass diamond, on a barge on the Rhone River. That was magnificent. And but when I mentioned it to people, they would often laugh. And I I I we when I met with Christoph, he didn't laugh. Instead, he began a conversation about Gropius and Oscar Schlemmer and Avramov 
and Avartov and Bogdanov and an entire world of, of where dance had, was very much part of it, that, that he possesses this culture that, uh, that I intuited out of a, a feeling that art belongs to everyone. Culture belongs to everybody. Creativity belongs, sits in everybody. N now that's not all that different from early Russian revolutionary pro pro prolet cult. Prolet cult. Cult of going into the factories and making the workers cultural workers. There's a stream there. I was not, I intuited that. I read here and there a little bit. My, I have a pretty heavy duty art education, but it wasn't part of our education. So in terms of educator, the, there are many streams of creativity, I think, that, um, that get left out. That's, that's ter a terrible thing. So on the one hand, I'm saying, you know, the, the teacher that I benefited from w let me go, or let me take risks, or, and, but they were very supportive. That's, that's sort of very open-ended. But on the other hand, there are huge streams of creativity, go, as, as Christoph mentioned, going way, way, this guy, the guy with the flotilla making his symphony. <laughs> I wish I knew that guy. I always actually wanted to make a ballet in the New York Harbor with everything, like everything. And he did it already. No, we arranged the meeting. Huh? We arranged the meeting. <laughs> some water. Thank you. Who took the photographs of the, the 1974 Soho performance? Who was responsible for documenting? Okay, great question. In the 70s, I did a whole bunch of performances, many performances. Most of them, uh, the, not that I make maintenance art one hour every day, but, but many of the other ones were uh, in, um, in conjunction. I was in Lucy Lepard's show called C7500, which is featured in this Brooklyn Museum show now in this Connie Butler's book. There's sort of a lot of stuff has come out about this uh, exhibition. In those days, in the 70s, um, the, the venue that where I did a performance work provided a photographer. I don't even know the person's, people's names. They took the photographs. They handed me the negatives. Thank God. And I lucked out that, you know, really fine photographers captured these, that's all I have. And especially. And I didn't speak to them. The, you know, I felt that this was also highly ideological. I do the performance. I don't direct the, how the, they, their photographer, they do what they do. I do what I, you know, now I, I would, um, I mean, actually in the ballet in Japan this past summer, I worked with this guy, Araki, Taka Araki, who he's a wonderful videographer. He worked so hard, so, but he's one person. And he, part of the time he had another, but there's multiple. So I wanted him to see this, but he saw that. So I wish I could also, at the same time, besides working with the workers to do the ballet, direct the video. Well, I don't know how to work that out. <laughs> It's a, bit, it's a big, especially with a, a f work that evanesces, right? Can you imagine? As if it were staged, right? I look at that picture, I think, oh my God, look at that. How did that person even value what that person did? How, lu how lucky, lucky. Because there are many other people around. They could have been looking at someone else. Um, thank you. So these are my questions. In Japan, how did the trucks fall down dead? 
Um, oh, I'm sorry, Ken. In Japan, how did the trucks fall down dead? Um, in Romeo and Juliet, how did they fall down dead? Oh, and they didn't fall down dead. They just dragged their blades on the ground. Okay. They just like tucked them down and dragged them off. Thank you. And it, on Madison Avenue, <coughs> why did the action go down Madison Avenue instead know. of up? I can't even Cause imagine. Because uh, they closed the whole street. Can you imagine? The, this was on Museum Mile. Yeah. So I think they canceled all the traffic because um, people were walking from one museum to the other on that night. That was the occasion of the art parade. It was called the first New York City art parade. And they just stopped all the traffic and it went the wrong way. I don't know. And the last, thing I, the last thing I want to ask is about these vehicles themselves, about offering inspiration. Um, things that I could think of are, um, if this was anywhere near a, a year that had the Winter Olympics, you know, um, y you, you could have um, suggested an image of skiers moving this way and that way, <laughs> or the um, ice skaters uh, twirling in circles. Um, but I wonder whether they, th oh, and then of course there's ballroom dancing and um, where they try to um, be in, in tandem as close as possible. Um, so but then on the other hand, vehicle drivers like to show off as in air shows. And I wonder which of the two directions, if any, um, the actual drivers thought of. The, the air show kind of um, showing you know, off. Well, I think that uh, a, re a common reference uh, for people who drive big vehicles would be a truck rodeo. Because that's, that's a thing. I don't know if they would call it an artwork, but that's sort of a cultural truck thing, truck rodeos, very skills festivals. I think we'll have to end the session because it's getting late. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.